Welcome to Threshold Stories, a podcast about people crossing thresholds, one story at a time. I'm your host, Jeff Cora. I'm an author, athlete, and coach, and adventure travel guide. This show explores topics like fitness, overcoming adversity, faith and science, travel, and my favorite, what it takes to be a Christian author in the 21st century. Podcast 122, um, the 2023 World Championships and something called the Peak End Rule come together. Um, I could rename this entire podcast, Why Would You Do That? And I'm more likely to get people to understand at the end what it is I'm trying to talk about. So let me jump forward to um, what the World Championship was, what it meant, and perhaps some insight for some of you. Before I go any further, I want to thank Madeline Romeo for giving me this introduction to the peak end rule and giving me some science to think about and stare at um, before I recorded this podcast, because it's just about two weeks overdue since I've come back from the World Championships, and I knew what I wanted to talk about, but I quite didn't have a framework for how to put it, so thank you, Madeline, for giving me the idea for this. So let's jump to it. Um, myth number one that comes up repeatedly um, as people get to know me and discover me is they somehow think that I'm an Olympian or an Olympic athlete. So first myth, the best athletes compete in the Olympics. Okay, not true. Most sports in the world are not Olympic sports. I mean, just look within our country. Um, the biggest dollar sporting event in our country is football. That's not an Olympic sport. Uh, the biggest gambling event in our country, horse racing. That too is not an Olympic sport. So mm, the sports that people are putting money on, the people, the sports that people are watching in mass and TV, those are not Olympic sport. Even within the, the sport of triathlon, we have four different distances. And with each distance, there's multiple varieties of each sport. The only sport, uh, single person discipline is currently, there was only one distance of the four that's included in the Olympics. And of all the different varieties, the only one that they have is the mixed relay, a four person mixed relay. So in general, most of the triathlon sports are not in the Olympics either. So start with that myth. Um, myth number two that has to go with a world championships is everybody that goes is the best in their country. So Best in their country represents a phrase that's often misinterpreted because it assumes everybody's in one bucket. Um, it includes inclusivity, which is not true. The idea that everybody's the same isn't really fair because we break things out. There's men and there's women, but we also have para-athletes. So there's a whole division of blind athletes. Amy Dixon has been on this podcast before. She's a blind athlete who competed. And then you have different levels of para-athletes who are missing limbs or having a disadvantage. And based on the amount of their body that is missing, they get placed in a different category as well. So within the disciplines, they make exceptions to that, but they also striate it based on age. So I race in the category of 55 to 59-year-olds. Um, most everybody whom I coach is in either the 25 to 29 or the 30 to 34-year-olds. There are exceptions, but that's most of them. And they're competing against others who are like them. So they're not competing against somebody who's biologically different or, you know, chronologically different. So let's start with that. So now that that's tabled, let's talk about what it takes to get there. So the world championships that exist for every country in the world lack a governing body. So there's no entity that says, here's who's allowed to be in your world championships. Each country gets to decide for themselves. So within the United States, we have a single qualifying event each year. And if you make it to the qualifying event, based on how you do against people who are like you, they'll offer you a position on Team USA. That's just the generic name for making the top list and being eligible to compete. So I compete against other men who are 55 to 59-year-old who think they're pretty good. Within the scope of the United States, I almost always do well enough in that pool to earn a slot. My friend Ed and I have been doing this together literally since I think you know Kennedy was assassinated. He and I basically are side-by-side most of the time when we do competitions and we both know that the act of qualifying although it takes an awful lot of work is also pretty reasonable um, there are some people who are basically automatically qualify because there's just not that many people in their age doing it people who are more than 80 know that if they cross the finish line they're in i mean the actuaries say they should be dead but they're not they're still racing so they're going to get automatically get a chance to compete on the national stage so in, my, in our case, in 2022, there was a national championship in Texas, and Ed and I did well enough in that event to qualify for the world championships this year, which happened in April, end of April, in Ibiza, Spain. So we knew that our goal when we lined up at the starting line in Texas 
last year was to try to qualify to compete in Ibiza this year. And so that's what just went through. So let's talk a little bit about the buildup for the event. When I began um, Threshold Academy a few years ago, one of the goals I had in mind was to take people who were, whether I perceived them as such or they perceived them as themselves as such, was to take people who were pretty good, mediocre, and make them exceptional. So my intentions were to take athletes, people who perceived that exercise was a part of who they were, whether they were successful or not, because an athlete doesn't necessarily earn that title because they're successful. It's more about a mindset than anything else. It's a, it's an approach to your body. It's the temple of God more than anything else. So I gathered a group of people, called them, you know, no different than say uh, a rabbi would call a disciple to say, follow me. So I taught them what I knew and I helped prepare them for the world championships with the intention being once you're ready for these, you don't need what I have to offer anymore. You now can become a rabbi and you too can go out into the world and call your own followers. And that's basically what's happening. But this was my first, I'm going to call it batch, my first batch of disciples who prepared themselves to go. And um, having all of them together at this one dinner right here for me creates a, a, a soul resonance, a portion of me that says, I did the good stuff of this world. I woke up and I fought the fight. So in the, you know, in the front here on the left is Carolyn. She's historically done really well at these events. Uh, she moved up in age category this year. And then we have Jordan and his family as well. His entire family came. Well, that's not true. His mother and father um, came to the event. Um, Connor came with his very, very pregnant wife, Crystal. Mike was there with his wife, and who incidentally she also competed, which I think is the unspoken success story of this entire podcast. Um, and I was able to bring all of them to a Nepali food restaurant in Ibiza, and I was able to take ownership over ordering food in my quote-unquote second mother language for everybody and see them enjoy it. It was, you know, we're in another part of the world with a food group from a different part of the world with the people who I've truly invested in. Yes, they spent money with me, but most of them don't spend money with me anymore. They know everything I do and can train themselves now, which is the whole goal of the first thing, her whole goal in the first place. So I find this group to be my um, success story. This is why I did what I do in addition to the, the tours and these podcasts that I do. So I think that's pretty important to stress to, to talk about. So let's jump to the actual race itself and fast forward to the peak end rule. So I have raced, as you can see on the screen here, 10 times at the World Championships. Seven out of 10 times, I've finished in the bottom half of the world. So I am the proverbial Cleveland Browns of duathlon or the Chicago Cubs, however you want to phrase it. I don't want to say Pittsburgh Pirates because one of the, my friends whom I ride with is a partial owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates, but it's that sort of mentality. It's like you're at the top league, but you can't win against the, the most elite of teams, which is true. I'm not going to try to fight on that. Yet I love to do the sport, and I'm going to continue to do the sport, even though my numbers aren't that good. And I think the um, explanations here are, worthy of more than just a commentary or two. I think some of you guys probably ought to ponder memorizing this because you'll find that this peak end rule is going to trickle through into other parts of your life, not necessarily just fitness. So I've run plus or minus at a seven minute mile, a little bit slower, a little bit faster, depending on what day it is. And for most men, that's pretty darn awesome. For most 55 to 59 year old men, it's epic. Most men can't if I add on that, I ride my bicycle, you know, 22 to 23 miles an hour when I'm by myself, even on a somewhat hilly course. And that's extremely excellent. Among cyclists, that's top 1%, let alone my own age group. That's still pretty good. But when I line up at the world championships, I am in the bottom half. There are many, not one or two, but many guys in my age who are running sub six minute miles. They're in the fives per mile for the course of 10 miles or eight miles. And I cannot consider hanging with them unless I'm on like an e-bike or something. But I still love competing with them. And I, it, that kind of jumps me forward to um, um, the peak end rule. So let me jump it. I've talked about it enough. Let's kind of jump to it. So in 1993, some people asked the question, why do people like doing epically hard events and can find themselves being pulled back into it? So that was kind of the question. Or specifically, why do people who experience a lot of pain during an event find themselves gravitating back to it. It wasn't Pavlov's dog. It wasn't some sort of um, sick negative response to a stimuli that was uh, overwhelming to them. They discovered something else. So a group of four scientists, and everybody, Kahneman gets his name stuck on it, did some experimentation in 1993, so plus or minus 30 years ago, 
And he brought a group of participants together, <clears throat> and he subjected them to two different versions of a single unpleasant experience. So he broke it out this way. One group of people submerged their hand in 14 degrees Celsius water for 60 seconds, and another group had one hand in 14 degree water for 60 seconds, but they had a second hand in a little bit colder water, I'm sorry, a little bit warmer water, 15 degree water for 30 seconds more. So they had a 90 second difference there. And um, the subjects were then offered the option to repeat the trial and they got to pick which one they wanted. So Kahneman was fascinated when he learned or when he observed that people were more willing to repeat the second trial despite the prolonged exposure to uncomfortable temperatures. Kahneman and others concluded that subjects closed the long trial simply because they liked the memory of it better than the alternative. So it's this fascinating idea that people evaluate discomfort not necessarily on how horribly they feel in the middle, because we all feel horrible in the middle when we do our sport, but the final end moments oftentimes override whatever experience we're feeling in the middle. So let me give you the specifics of our event. So in duathlon, when you get off the bicycle at the end of the bike ride, you've typically gone as hard as you can for the amount of time in question. So if it's an hour race, you've paced an hour long bike ride, you've paced yourself so you emptied your tank at the end of the hour. If it's a sprint distance and you're getting off the bike in 30 minutes or less, you've truly done a lot of bursts and kicks so that when you get off the bike, the body distribution of blood and fluids is not normal, right? When you're on the bicycle, all your body weight is basically sitting on the saddle. You occasionally stand up, but your legs are turning as hard as they can, but they're not weight-bearing in the traditional sense. So when we get off of our bicycles and rack them, take off our cycling shoes, and then put on our running shoes and take off as hard as we can to get to the finish line, it's a, it's a mile and a half to three miles away, depending on event. In some cases, it could be a whole marathon away. But those first 90 seconds when we start running, when we have blood distribution that's just not even accurate, it's not correct, our bodies are out of whack, it really hurts. That's our pain cave for most of us. For some people, they can't look at anybody. There's typically people cheering when we start running, but most of us can hear absolutely nothing at all because we know we've got about 90 seconds to get through before our blood distribution gets back to normal and we can start running with at least some degree of comfort. Um, but when w there's magic that happens after we start getting warmed up, and it's called the finish line. When we see the finish line for us, it's more than just a, a, a goal at the, end of, uh, at the end of a single race. For most of us, the buildup to a world championship is a year long, in, case, in some cases much longer. And we've invested a lot to get there. We've had to fly there. We've been worrying about our, our nutrition leading up. We've had kind of conversations with perhaps a nutritionist for race day itself. But those final end moments, those final single digit number of seconds, when we see the huge banner and says world championships finish line, and you see the clock ticking and flags flying from all the countries and spectators by the hundreds, if not thousands, I don't have experience with thousands, but by the hundreds always at the finish line screaming for you, it's um, got it's got an insane value to it that we can't put a put a put a words on to explain. Um, more often than not, there's a representative from our country handing out U.S. flags, and as you get close, you can grab a small flag, six inches by you know nine inches, and in a single piece of wood, and you grab that flag from your country's representative and you hold it high, you hold it with pride as you run across the finish line. Um, more than once I've crossed the finish line with somebody from another country and he's holding up his flag or she's holding up her flag. And we each have an insane sense of pride, even though perhaps we can't speak to each other in each other's language. You know, I crossed the finish line this time, I think with somebody from Slovenia, I've never been to Slovenia. I don't even know what their language sounds like, but looking at that person and nodding and giving them a high five, it wouldn't have mattered what country they were from. We were both celebrating an, an amazing experience. So, to translate for people why I do world championships, it's that feeling at the end, those final end moments, as Kahneman describes, that justify all the value. I love crossing the finish line and saying to myself, you just completed a world championship. Very few people can say that. This time it was super cool because I can say when I, I said when I crossed the finish line, you just completed your 10th world championship. 
Most people never do one, as I say, let alone 10. No, I don't have a goal of 100 world championships, and I don't have like a, a notch. I mean, behind me on the walls, you can see some of the accolades from competing and doing a lot of the other world championships I've been a part of. But there's, there's a value to it that I can't put to words. Um, each of you has some event out there that you would love to do, but you simply haven't done it yet because you know there's pain in the middle. For some people, it's finishing up their PhD. You know, for other people, it's starting their own business. And you know that that pain in the middle is just, you're not going to get around it. There's just too much hard work. You've got children. You're going to have to take a loan out against your 401k. There's something in the middle that's preventing you from doing it. And we all know we have something like that. We've probably even spoken to our friends about it, but we've never pulled the trigger on it. I think Kahneman and his group um, even studied colonops, colonoscopies and lithotripsy, lithotripsy procedures to try to create some more real-world findings that would validate this concept um, that I've been describing to you. Um, so more pain is actually preferable, and world championships sometimes give you that more pain that makes it all worth it. Stay tuned. Podcast 123 will be coming up, and that'll be a kickoff to the Blue Ridge Parkway. Thanks for listening. Jeff's books can be found at all major outlets. If you'd like to participate in any of our adventure travel, visit thresholdacademy.com and click on the links. If you wish to hire Jeff as a speaker, please visit jeffgora.com and fill out the form.